You often single? Am I often single? Mm -hmm. I suppose so, yeah. Mm. Are you? Yeah. But not for want of trying. Hello, I'm Andrew Scott. And I'm Paul Meskel. Our new movie is All of Us Strangers. And mark it. Camera set and action! You alright? No, yeah, yeah. Just haven't done <laughs> Hi, Paul. Hi. <laughs> So what was your first response to Andrew Hay's script? My first feeling was that it was the most extraordinarily original script. Yeah. It is about Adam, who is a screenwriter. He lives in a new apartment block in London. I wouldn't say he's depressed, but he's certainly kind of locked himself away from the world. One night, he meets Harry. I saw you looking at me from the street. I've seen you a bunch of times coming and going with your head down. Harry lives in the tower block with Adam. He should be a lot happier than he is. I think their kind of loneliness mirrors each other. Is this your mum and dad? Yeah. They died just before I was 12. I'm trying to write about them at the moment. How's it going? Strangely. He decides to go back to his childhood home and he comes across his parents who are long dead and he sees them as they did when they died. So they are now younger than he is. And a relationship starts to develop between him and his parents. Our boys back home. Everybody can relate to that idea of wanting to go back and to redefine what your relationship with your parents was. That sort of starts this story for him where he starts to open himself up to, to find love. So it's about his um, two different forms of love, sort of familial love that we all experience when we're children and then kind of romantic um, adult love and how you, those two things affect each other and how you can maybe can't give yourself over to full adult love if you haven't reconciled some stuff in your childhood. I'm assuming you're not with anyone. I never see you with anyone. Andrew Scott was choice number one, so he was the, the sort of perfect Adam. So that was pretty much a dream that we got him. There's very few people that could carry off a lot of the sort of internal emotions he has to play in this movie. I liked the idea that, that Adam's life was going in a good direction in like the 90s and the noughties and was feeling good. And then it started to get more and more complicated as he's got older. So he has stopped living within the world in any kind of productive way. I'd always felt lonely. This was a new feeling, like uh, terror, that I'd always be alone now. I feel like all of Andrew Scott's choices and everything that I've ever seen have been nothing but interesting. It's so satisfying to work with somebody that you've admired kind of from afar for so long, and you realize, oh, there's nothing. He is just, I think, perfect in this film. Drink is Japanese. I think that's a good idea. How about I come in anyway? If not for a drink, then for whatever else you might want. Harry, who's in his mid-twenties, kind of hides behind being sex positive and sex forward and kind of fun. <laughs> do I scare you? No. We don't have to do anything if I'm not your type. Paul's just a great actor. I think he has a really interesting mix of sensitivity and strength. You don't need to be shy around me. Yes, that's easier said than done. <laughs> Would you like me to close my eyes? <laughs> yes, yes, please. <laughs> there was a spark to Harry and an openness to Harry that Adam doesn't have. And I think you're always drawn to someone that offers something different than what you have. I think they're both very uh, vulnerable people. They talk a lot about their experiences as children. And I think it's one of those things where they immediately uh, love each other. I've been thinking about you all week today. I was thinking about watching crappy TV with you on a Friday night. Watching old episodes of Top of the Pops from before I was born. <laughs> <laughs> One of the challenges for me and Paul to play was uh, how do you play chemistry without giving away too much biography? I think both of us really like the idea of playing love. And it's a very beautiful thing to get to play. So when you were thinking about Adam and Harry, how did you first consider approaching that? It's funny even talking about it now, I, I have such an enormous affection for them. <laughs> yeah, Do you know yeah, what I mean? Totally. They feel like friends. Yeah, and, exactly, uh, exactly. Sense. That we don't see anymore. Yeah, because they're not real. <laughs> <laughs> they're fictional characters. They're fictional yeah. characters. You know, chemistry exists on screen when the actors are good. <laughs> and they're both very, very good actors. So I was never afraid that there wouldn't be that chemistry. They were funny because they came thick as thieves very quickly. 
You're like, wow, they're just hanging out all the time. They bonded incredibly quickly and found exactly where they could sit with their characters and how, therefore how their characters might sit with each other in the film. I suppose we take it for granted about how easy we found it. Because yeah. we were sitting on that bed laughing for, for a yeah. lot of it. Which, you know, it's also it didn't feel like it, it felt organic and it's only when we're talking about the film now that it's a takeaway that many people have. But it felt like the building of a major, a major relationship that I'm going to have for the rest of my life. I'm scared. I know. But I'm here with you. Shall we go? Go where? Oh. The project was originally based on a book called Strangers by a Japanese author, Tachi Yamada. I've always wanted to work with Andrew, so it was simpatico that Andrew really responded to the material as well, and then really made it his own, I have to say, because it's, it's a big departure from the book. What I loved about it was this central conceit about someone, an adult, meeting their parents again when essentially they are the same age as him. So I loved that idea of basically meeting your parents, reparenting again. Guess what I found loitering in the park? Is it him? Oh yeah, it's definitely him. Yes, it is you. Hi. Hi. What I made sense of it as is that they are real for him and they are real in their own way, and also in the way that dreams make sense. If you dream of someone who was a loved one who's deceased, it doesn't make it any less real or important to you when you wake up. The way that me and Claire, specifically as his mum and dad, who are technically apparitions, is that we are just living in the moment. We are not considering that this has a finite time on it. That's what I loved about it when Andrew came to me, is that it's just, when your son comes home, you're just so happy that he's there, that you just, you sink right back into the normalcy. It's so bloody lovely to see you again. Why sure we ever would? Adam's character misses his parents. It's as simple as that. And he has memories of his childhood, obviously. He has memories with them, but they are fading as time goes on. So there was a certain kind of mixture of memory and nostalgia and desperate need and all of those things within this relationship. So we essentially get to live Adam's teenage life again with him as he's reimagining or re-experiencing his past. God, look at you. You were just a boy. And now you're not. You look totally different, but it's still you. The big question that people ask is like, was that weird to have people who are younger than you playing people that are older than you? And yeah. not at all. It wasn't in any way strange. They both just embraced those characters so brilliantly. I think all four of us really, I don't know, it sounds ridiculous in say, but um, really enjoy acting. Yeah. <laughs> it's, no, actors, I, it's not all actors well, do. Our actors went like, oh, well, well, I agree, know. yeah. I felt, just felt like my job in it was to try and access the sort of boyish part of me, the childish part of me. Um, they just made it so easy for me. The age thing kind of never felt odd. We just treated him like he was our kid. A kid that has all this life experience now, all this perspective. Not sure I have much wisdom to share. I don't know, maybe Adam being older should be sharing some with us. It's so funny, Andrew kind of came back behind the cameras a couple of times to talk to me and Claire, and he, he, I think it was on the first day, and he was just kind of like, it just feels so weird, it just kind of feels like you're his parents. He made everyone feel so safe and assured, and after our first sort of rehearsal, very brief rehearsal, I just never really questioned it after that. We felt like a family. Really, really, we felt like a family, yeah. Really bizarre. Yeah, are you ready? I'm gonna press it. Merry Christmas. Oh, Merry Christmas. Here you go. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Cut, good. Very nice. Good. Have you got a girlfriend? I'm gay. As in homosexual? As in uh, that, yeah. Really? Yeah. Since when? Ah, uh, since a long time. How long? Forever. It gets complicated as the film goes on because his parents never really knew the real Adam. And so he has to try and become known by his parents. And that can be a troubling and difficult thing. Aren't people nasty to you? No, no. no things are different now. Because well, they aren't nasty. Not allowed, anyway. I really connect a lot to a lot of it uh, personally. Um, being a gay person myself, those experiences of hoping that your family will stay with you when you tell them who you are. Uh, I think everybody wants to feel connected to their family. They weren't 
angels. They were real people who, if they were living now, would be much older and have certain values and sort of beliefs. So they have to sort of evolve as the film evolves. They say it's a very lonely kind of life. They don't actually say that anymore. Kids, to a certain degree, are a reflection of what you managed to provide for them. You know, I think as a parent, you don't want to make mistakes, but you will. You told me not to cross my legs like a woman over and over and over again. Do they? Yeah, I still, I still think about it every time I cross my legs. And what I like about what Adam has to deal with is that we come to listen to him and come to respect him. And then a way kind of come to set him free. I'm sorry I never came in your room and you were crying. It's okay. Dad, I get it. It was, it was so long. <laughs> It was so long ago. I felt very physically comfortable with them because I think a child would. Yeah. As he gets to know them better, he actually becomes much more tactile with them. And as he's learning a new kind of physicality with, with yeah. Harry, it becomes more physical as the, as the yeah. movie moves on. And I think that's a really important important part of the storytelling. I love them and I'll, I'll think of them as my sexy mum and dad for the rest of my life. <laughs> as you should. <laughs> can I walk you now? Yeah, please. Hello, I'm Andrew. Sorry. Hello, I'm Andrew Scott. <laughs> Hello, I'm Andrew Scott. And I'm Paul Meskel. And um, oh no, you say that. Oh, right. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, not, oh, that's that was one. the line of lines. <laughs> Sweetheart, you came back. Of course, I came back. When I was writing the script, I was imagining a house, and it just happened to be that the house I was imagining was my own childhood house. Then we got a location manager on. So that process is one where you go, fantastic, it says in the script, suburban house, Sanders dead, can you find one? And the starting point was Andrew Haig's original house he actually grew up in. And who knew that we were gonna end up filming in exactly the house where he grew up, exactly where he was the age of the story. Initially I wasn't gonna film in it, and then I thought, okay, but I wanna set it in the area where I used to live, which is just outside of Croydon. It was a really odd experience being in there, but I do think it helped the film. I think it helped the actors. I think it was fascinating for them to think that they were within the place that I used to be a kid in. Typically of Andrew, he didn't really make too much of a big deal out of that. Um, I kept thinking, is this extraordinary for you? And he was like, no, no, it's, you know, it just turned into a film set. But it's an incredibly brave thing to do. It feels that like we're given an opportunity to kind of fully immerse into Andrew's old life. And, and get to play these parts that he's written so beautifully for us. It was a really unusual experience. Not one I'd actually repeat <laughs> ever again. I don't ever want to go back there. And the one thing that was really strange was sitting in my old bedroom and then hearing like the film crew all around, setting up things, talking about the scenes, all that kind of thing. And it was such a strange feeling to think that this is where I was when I was like six, seven years old. And, the idea that you'd be back here all that time later filming in this house is so insane. <laughs> Completely insane. Is this real? Does it feel real? Yeah. There you go then. The house was like a sort of capsule to the 80s. I mean, it really was like going back in time. The design team, the costume team were sort of painstaking in their research. When I went into Adam's childhood bedroom, there were so many things in there that I had in my own childhood bedroom. I was taking pictures of them and sending them to my siblings going, oh my God, do you remember this? And um, they just did that really beautifully. It was easy for us all to recapture the 80s. Basically, we've all got photos. So we just looked at old photos from that time and saw how we used to look and what our houses were like and where we used to live. You know, obviously things from Andrew's childhood that he should have, the very specific albums that he wanted, you know, certain books of, as dressing. Just bits and bobs and, you know, a lot of certain games that he'd reference. For the hairstyles and the, the makeup. But Andrew Haig didn't want to go avert the 80s. So when I initially did a mood board for him, I did lots of very 80s style, big perms, big hair. Uh, and he was like, no, 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 let's, let's not go a typical cliched 80s, let's just rein it back in. I think everyone really enjoyed it because, you know, quite a few of the crew were around in the 80s growing up, so we were all able to sort of put our own little stamp on it in there. I would say it, it was a really fun one in terms of that. And the rest of it was pretty much all shot down in Sandstead, which is just outside Croydon. We shot in the park that's always been there. We're gonna have some wind blowing and knees that will suddenly just like stop. Then you feel like someone's looking behind you and you turn around, he's kind of standing here. There's a shopping centre in Croydon that I remember going to as a kid a lot. Croydon, there's a slightly 
strange out of time feeling about it. It's like a vision of the future that was made in the 60s. In London itself, we did a little bit of shooting. 68, Charlie, take two. Action. We're basically the only ones here. Can you believe that? I mean, they haven't got security guards yet. The modern side of the film is in this giant tower block, which is in Stratford in East London. It's such a key part of the story because it really symbolises the characters feeling very disconnected from the world. So we all had a real vision in mind, um, and then it was very tricky to, to find the right thing. So we did have to build it as a set, having scouted about 800 tower blocks. I like shooting on location as well as my preference. I much, much prefer it, but it's very hard to shoot in a high-rise apartment because they're a nightmare to light and you need to have lights outside and it's very, very difficult. So I knew we were going to have to probably build a set for that. The question you always have is what's going to be outside that apartment? And in the olden days, one might have put what's called green screen there, which means you can drop in an outside environment. We had a new technique on this, which was just a myriad of extraordinary TV screens, all locked together. We shot plates from the apartment block that we were basing our apartment block on, and then they became the backdrop that was on this LED wall that surrounded the apartment that we built on the set. You're giving the actors context on what they can ex be experiencing outside. They can use that to plant their performance, just to be able to, to take a completely black studio and then you're creating the most intimate of scenes where anybody who watches it would never question what's beyond the, the, the walls of the set. There's such a beauty and an honor to that. I think that when you live in some of those apartments, it's very easy to feel very isolated from everybody else and feel like there is nobody else. For both of the characters, they feel like they, they've been pushed away from home for various reasons. And that leads, I think, to a kind of sense of isolation in your life. I don't go home much. Does that make you sad? I've always felt like a stranger in my own family. I never did know what was going on in that odd little head of yours. You were always running away, do you remember? Yeah. I took a pretty naturalistic approach to how the film is shot. We shot on 35. Nobody ever wants to shoot on film because it's expensive. But for me, it was really important. It has film inherently has a, a texture and a feeling. And this is a film about the past. You know, they listen to records and they are looking at photographs. And it sort of is a way to access the past, I think, if you shoot it in a certain way. That doesn't feel like pastiche or anything, but just allows you to feel like this is closer to memory. It's funny, it doesn't take much to make you feel the way you felt back there again, skin all raw. I felt it was important to be able to represent this idea of memory and nostalgia because that's such a big part of it, you know, the idea that there's this sort of gilding that, that one puts on a memory that I thought this is also something I wanted to represent in the cinematography. You're dealing with the real world and a very surreal layer on top of this world. And that was another element that I really I felt I, I, I needed to represent in, in some manner. And I thought perhaps that could be more the way the image felt in terms of lighting and perhaps the lens choice and things like that. It's definitely got a kind of tone to it that, you know, we've worked on in terms of how we do the sound design. Wait, you promise me you're not going to go out now? I promise. You have to be a filmmaker when you're making film scores. You have to think about what the film is saying and what's the best way to serve that. Coming from the conversation with Andrew about the nature of memory, when you remember something, it's never fully clear. It's often also a small element of one day that you're gonna remember a specific element and, and the rest is a little bit blurry, a little bit harder to define. And it felt right that the music had this sense of not being fully real, not being fully anchored with our reality, but really helping the audience to drift off in a sense of like a dream-like quality. What was super important editorially was to have this feeling of dislocation. Adam goes down to the park, he sees his father, and it's this kind of odd sense of, is this happening in real time? Is this, who is this person? You're asking questions of, about who this person is, but also where you are in time. For an audience, if you can get them to be part of that journey, that makes for a very successful film. You're active with, with the main character, you're feeling their feelings in a sense, and you're discovering all the things that are new in front of them with them. Will you come with me? Where to? 
I think that the journey of a man who is essentially isolated and has built a world of isolation due to bereavement at a young age, his journey to love feels incredibly positive. The truth of the film to me is I spent a lot of this film incredibly happy. Yeah. Like, yeah. the sadness of the film isn't the tone and the style of direction, but a lot of our stuff together... Absolutely. Was, I think we had to consciously play against the sadness yeah. of it, but ultimately they're beginning an incredibly healthy relationship. The love story is beautiful and great, and how we should embrace love and, and take that risk and gamble on it, because you never know, like, where it can send you, and that's what's so exciting and thrilling about it. Are you in love with him? I don't know. I've never been in love before, so... I don't know if this is it. You think he'd like to be in love with him? Andrew's film is very specific and it's very personal to him, the journey. I think that it has really universal themes. I think we've all had people in our lives that perhaps we'd like another chance with. And that's what I think is beautiful about the film. It is telling a wider story about relationships and parental relationships and being a kid and, and also romantic relationships. And it is about love and in all its forms and how they're interconnected. There's no doubt in my mind that I think queer audiences will respond to it because, you know, this, of the subject matter. The isolation of uh, being a gay person in a family. But it's also just about families as well. Absolutely. It's a, a film about human experience probably yeah. rooted in the queer experience to me. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And that's not as... We're, as, we're much more similar to each other than we allow ourselves to believe. Yeah. So I hope films like this just really just blow that Yeah, open. I think it would be incredibly disappointing to me if this was a film that simply existed and I don't think it will exist in the queer lexicon of queer cinema. It's dealing with way more than just that. It's the human condition. Yeah. It's grief. about life and It's death. about life yeah. and love and grief. Yeah. I think there's a very beautiful, extraordinary hit film here that is unlike anything else and I'm excited for audiences to see that. The films that I like and the films that I want to make lead to more questions when the film is over. I want people to leave the cinema and think about their own relationships, both as a parent, as a child, as a partner, you know, as a friend, whatever that might be, and how this film might reflect on their lives like that. So that's the kind of thing I love when you, you know, four days later, suddenly remember something in the film and go, oh, you know what, maybe I should call my mum, or maybe I should be nicer to my boyfriend, or maybe I should do this, or whatever that might be. I want to go out, you and me, together, into the world.